Welcome to Market Matters, our markets podcast on Making Sense, the hub for J.P. Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In this episode of Market Matters, we'll hear from the market data and positioning intelligence teams within our data assets and alpha group. They'll be talking about key macro, micro, and political themes in the context of our high-frequency trading data and proprietary signals from J.P. Morgan's markets business. Hi, I'm Eloise Goulder, head of the Data Assets and Alpha Group here at JP Morgan. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Frederick Yatch to talk all things long run, using his long run data techniques to help contextualize markets today. Frederick has developed a data product called the Strategic Index Fundamental Toolkit, or SIFT. It's a vast data set going back to the early 1960s, so I'm looking forward to asking him all about it and how we can potentially read into it to better understand markets today, particularly in the context of elevated inflation and a potential aggressive hiking cycle by various Western central banks. I'm also looking forward to asking Frederick about how he goes about forecasting future market behaviour and the pros and cons of using classical versus machine learning quantitative techniques to do this. So, Frederick, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Eloise, for having me on this podcast. Oh, it's a real pleasure. So, could you start by introducing yourself and what your role is here at JP Morgan? What do you do to help our clients? I work in the Strategic Indices Group, which is part of equity structuring. My role is focused on using machine learning techniques applied to various data sets to uncover patterns in the market, where generally those patterns are often alpha and not relating to classical factors, such as value momentum or the market as a whole. Those alpha patterns are generally driven by the interaction between data and mathematics, uh, an alpha source that we've chosen to call computational alpha. And it's from the idea that it may not simply be just the data or just the algorithm that gives us the return, but rather the combination. The idea here is that one single data point, say the return on equity for a company, may not on its own be very valuable for predicting future returns. But combined with other data or put in simply into a context, a valuable signal may actually present itself. And in my role, I develop investable products that are built around this concept of computational alpha, but I also focus on developing data sets that can uh, help both us at JP Morgan and our clients to gain valuable insights in markets. That's really fascinating. Thank you, Frederick. It's probably worth taking a step back to define what you mean by alpha here. I think of it in textbook form as the residual return delivered by a given stock after factoring in other known variables like the beta or the market's returns, and also perhaps after factoring in factor returns such as momentum and value, as you just mentioned. So the holy grail for many of us in finance is to forecast that alpha. Frederick, is that how you're thinking about alpha when you refer to uncovering and forecasting alpha patterns? Well, absolutely. First of all, I think alpha does not just have to be returned clean from every known variable. In a very basic way, we could define it as being what you can achieve in terms of return uh, in excess of what you may be compensated for in terms of risk premium. So timing factors or timing the market as a whole are two types of alphas. They're not clean from every known source. But an alpha source could also be to produce those returns that are basically uncorrelated to all the different factors or sectors. As you say, forecasting alphas accurately really is the holy grail in our world. And we think computational alpha is a strong but also sustainable approach when developing investable products for our clients. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. So you're deriving your computational alphas by combining the data and the algorithm in a specific way. Would you say this field of capturing computational alphas is a growth area? So is it more relevant today than, say, 10 or 20 years ago? We definitely see computational alpha as a growth area, though it's an area that grows from a quite small base within the overall investment community. So what's definitely true is that the market has, over the last 10 to 20 years, seen a large increase in systematic and quant strategies. What's less obvious is what proportion of those strategies are simpler classical quant strategies versus what we refer to here as computational alpha. That's a great point. 
And how would you define the difference between the computational alphas versus the classical quant strategies you just mentioned? Well, classical quant strategies are often static in their logic, and in many cases built with hindsight knowledge, meaning that the strategy is built around a known historical pattern that we've observed, and where there is an implied assumption that such a pattern will continue. But using computational alpha, by contrast, our goal is to find existing or emerging patterns that are statistically likely to have an efficacy over the time frame we're predicting over, without us telling the model what to think. We typically use machine learning for our computational alpha models, Rather than telling a strategy what to do, machine learning gives us the ability to let the strategy learn, just like any human would, from market patterns and to become continuously better at its task as we go. That's really interesting background. Thanks, Frederick. So let's dive into your toolkits. You've launched some really exciting data sets this year, and I think the most pertinent in the context of the current economic backdrop is your SIFT data. SIFT standing for Strategic Index Fundamental Toolkit. So can you explain what it is and why you created it? Yes, sure. So in a little bit of background, in my view, markets are pretty efficient, but they're not completely efficient. There's definitely room for creating residual value, or alpha, as we were just discussing, by trying to predict asset returns. And doing so basically is one large game where the market participants compete with knowledge, information, speed, and capacity. And if we zoom in on knowledge, knowledge can come from one's own experience or by studying research or historical patterns. We've found that in the investor base as a whole, on average, they rely more heavily on one's own experience rather than studying patterns of the past. But why would things that happened 50 years ago be relevant today? Some may claim that it's irrelevant. Markets and digitalization has changed the world profoundly. Though some of that may obviously be true, I have a rather different view. I tend to think that what happened 40 to 50 years ago may be more relevant for us today than what happened the last 20 years. Humans are intelligent and learn from their mistakes. Central banks learn from the results of their interactions, which means that if a pattern that occurred 10 to 20 years ago emerges again, the result may be different as compared to history, as market participants are quite unlikely to act in the same exact way again. However, patterns that market participants have not experienced themselves or have not studied may repeat themselves. Humans and our psychology has not changed heavily over time, meaning that something that happened 50 years ago is not really relevant. Even if markets and history don't simply repeat themselves completely, they often rhyme, to paraphrase Mark Twain. I love that quote, that even if markets don't simply repeat themselves completely, they often rhyme. And in fact, can't we argue that even if more and more machines and programs are involved in investing decisions today, well, A, they're designed by humans who may be biased by recent events, and B, in many cases, the data leveraged still only goes back, say, 10 or 20 years. For example, lots of news and social media models, including those leveraging NLP, i.e. natural language processing, often only really can leverage data over the last five or 10 years. So my point is, even quant techniques don't necessarily factor in the long term or 40 to 50 year ago view. Yes, exactly. And and the problem is that data going back so many years is extremely difficult to find, clean and create. From my background as a quant PM at the Swedish pension fund, I spend a lot of my efforts on obtaining high quality data with a deep cross section and history. That task was difficult and time consuming where you needed to connect various different sources or do manual mappings and setting up the infrastructure to handle the vast amounts of data that that results in. And in my role at JP Morgan, the idea of SIFT was born to have an extensive library of equity market aggregates that we could use when constructing our strategies and models, but that this data could also be available to clients. And back in my old role at the pension fund, I would absolutely have loved if SIFT was available. So I know that there are many people out there who would benefit from this data. Today, SIFT covers over 20,000 different equity market aggregates, all linked to around 50 different metrics, ranging from returns, risk, valuation, debt, and investment data with data going back to the early 1960s, meaning that this is likely one of the most comprehensive data sets out there in terms of equity products. That's such a great story. The idea that you actually put this data together to be the engine for your computational alpha models, but then realized this underlying data would be incredibly valuable for your investing counterparts. 
I remember that first discussion that you and I had. It must have been a year ago or so when you were explaining the hours and hours. In fact, I think it was years of hard work and pain you're put in to creating this underlying toolkit and how you and I came to realize that this could actually be a really valuable data set in itself for our clients. And now you've created it, that library of over 20,000 different equity aggregates, as you say, which you can slice and dice by region, by sector, by country, and across all those different fundamental variables with data going back to the early 1960s. So let's move on to what the data is telling you. On our podcast six weeks ago in late July, I discussed how we'd used your toolkit to measure the relative outperformance of energy and value this year through 2022 year to date versus how they'd performed through the 1970s decade. And the bottom line is we found that those two factors outperformed much more through the 1970s than they have so far this year. But what would you say are some of the most interesting observations that you've made from the data set this year? Good question. So the market regime we saw during Q1 and Q2 this year, where the fear of economy is going into stagflation, is one example where I think SIF definitely helped out. So as an example, stagflation has not been on people's radar over the last 20 or so years, meaning that evaluating market patterns over the last 20 years would not have been particularly fruitful in understanding how markets behave in such a scenario. However, looking at what happened in the mid-1970s may be more relevant. Back then, we also had a war, much higher energy prices and energy volatility, and concern around stagflation, i.e. declining growth concurrent with increase in inflation. The type of basket in terms of sectors or industries you would have found by evaluating historical patterns of actual stagflation look quite different from a basket found by looking at the last 20 years of data. And the latter has underperformed the former over the Q1 to Q2 period this year. Sectors such as energy tend to perform well in inflationary scenarios for perhaps obvious reasons, but maybe for less obvious reasons, the value factor also does as well. Furthermore, looking at historical data, we can also see that just evaluating inflation or growth on their own may be the wrong question to ask, as they're very much linked to each other. In terms of more recent developments, value, as well as baskets targeting stagflation, have in some implementations given up a chunk of their year-to-date performance which in my view is due to a general view in the market that inflation may have peaked. To give some concrete examples, the JP Morgan Long Short Global Pure Value Index has had a year-to-date active performance of 5%, down from around 11% at its peak in May, at a volatility of around 7%. And an implementation targeting stagflation that we launched earlier this year is up 2.2% year-to-date at around 3% tracking error, down from a peak of 4.5% year-to-date active performance in May. That's brilliant context. So the stagflation playbook as measured by your data sets has given up almost half of the year-to-date gains over the last couple of months. So what's your view in terms of what happens next, whether it's your personal view or anything you're seeing in your toolkits? My personal view is that with the energy crisis still looming and record droughts in Europe likely driving up food prices, I would personally not be surprised if inflation kept surprising us and that growth, as a consequence, declines faster than what we think. To put things into context, at its peak this year, our stagflation basket and general implementations of value had performance which was roughly a quarter of the performance that it showed during the stagflation period seen in the mid-1970s. One could, in theory, interpret this as if markets were to repeat themselves, if markets became surprised by even higher inflation and slowed growth, there may be further performance to be had in investing in both value or baskets specifically centered around stagflation. Thanks, Frederick. So bottom line is, you think that while your value and your stagflation implementations have given up almost half of their year-to-date gains over the last three months or so, they could re-emerge as outperforming themes in the coming months. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Your point there is very consistent with the comments I made during our podcast six weeks ago, leveraging your toolkit, where we explained that the value factor and the energy sector movements this year are just a scratch on what we saw during the 1970s. I just want to nail down one point on the value factor. I've noticed in our discussion today, we've been linking the value factor with the inflation theme. 
But that can come across as a bit broad brush, as there are so many sub-themes within any value classification. So how do you see the relationship between the value factor and inflation? Is it positive and is it linear, for example? In my view, value is linked to inflation risk. As supported by the long-term data in SIFT, value tends to outperform in periods where inflation is either high or is rising faster than expected. However, as you alluded to, the full picture is likely more complex, where idiosyncratic risks or temporary themes driving valuations may come to play for value in particular. Furthermore, to complicate things, we also generally see value outperforming in periods where inflation decreases faster than expected, forming a U-shape where performance tends to be poor when inflation is stable, but generally positive when inflation is either rising or declining. This in turn indicates that it may be the risk of inflation uncertainty that may be the driver of value. Furthermore, over the last few months, the inflation sentiment and expectations have cooled off a bit where markets seem to anticipate that inflation has peaked, but that it may not just fall rapidly from this point, meaning that the market has probably priced inflation being somewhere in the middle of the U-shape, which tends to be negative for value. On a separate note, I think non-linear dependencies are generally overlooked where it's of course simpler to explain and understand relationships where high is good and low is bad, but in reality it would be relatively surprising if all patterns we find are indeed linear. And the link between value and inflation may be one of those non-linear examples. Most classical quant strategies are in fact linear, and often built around one or just a few variables at a time. So going back to the discussion on computational alpha, that is indeed one of the things we aim to do, to capture those non-linear and non-trivial relationships. Thanks so much, Frederick. All fascinating. And of course, it does make sense that many of these relationships should not be linear or not necessarily be easy to describe. So finally, do you have any concluding remarks for our listeners, perhaps in terms of your data pipeline and the toolkits you're working on? In my team, we're constantly working on providing new products and data sets. And in the pipeline for next year, we're looking to further develop our SIFT offering. So SIFT currently covers over 20,000 different equity market aggregates, each linked to around 50 different metrics. But we aim to extend this offering with an engine to signal regime-specific expected returns. As an example, given the current regime and the specific data for the series in mind, we try to explain the various historical scenarios being closest to the current and what that means in terms of expected returns. We believe this may give clients a tool to contextualize market behavior in a novel way and may also act as a tool for tactical allocation of sectors, factors and regions. Furthermore, we're also working on launching forward-looking fundamentals and risk datasets for next year, utilizing the JP Morgan Pure Alpha Library framework developed within our team to produce, as an example, EPS growth estimates or forward-looking risk metrics such as the probability of severe underperformance. We may think of this as similar to analyst reported forward earnings, but instead, constructed in a systematic fashion. What we then end up with is a package of estimates built in an unbiased way with likely higher coverage and using a uniform methodology that at the same time will be highly diversifying with respect to classical approaches. That's really exciting. We actually discussed the need or our desire to create unbiased earnings estimates in our podcast six weeks ago. So it's brilliant and exciting to know that you're working on this. We're very excited to launch these new datasets, and perhaps that can be a topic of a future talk. Definitely. I really hope we'll be sitting down together for another podcast in the not-too-distant future to hear about these toolkit developments. So, before we wrap up, let me attempt to summarise your key arguments today. You're focusing on computational alphas, where you use machine learning models to identify alphas, leveraging long-term historic data. You see these methods as potentially advantageous versus classical models in that they can learn from the very long run and potentially identify non-linear relationships between macro variables and single stocks. To use these machine learning models, you really need a lot of data. 
And that's the reason you created your SIFT toolkit, to have that vast database of over 20,000 different data aggregates going back to the early 1960s with cleaned and normalized data, which you can then slice and dice by region, by sector, by factor, and by fundamental metric. And then bringing this to the present day, you've used this toolkit to compare factor performance this year versus in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, your stagflation and your value baskets delivered about four times the returns that we've seen them deliver at their peaks so far through 2022. So to use your words, Frederick, If the markets were to repeat themselves and become surprised by even higher inflation and slower growth, then there may be further performance to be had in investing in both your stagflation and your value expressions. It's worth putting this into context with our house research view, where our strategists remain particularly constructive on energy markets in the medium term, having written extensively around their supercycle analysis. So thank you once again, Frederick, for sharing your views today. Thank you, Eloise. It was a pleasure. I think you've created an incredible data set and it's really helpful to hear your insights and why you're going about all this work in the pursuit of alpha. Thank you also to our listeners for tuning in to this bi-weekly podcast from our group. Finally, it's worth flagging that our SIFT toolkit, like many of our markets and equities data sets, is made available to our clients via data feed on our data query platform. If you'd like to learn more about it, please contact our data and analytics sales team at data underscore analytics underscore sales at jpmorgan.com. Equally, if you'd like to explore our wider Data Assets and Alpha Group team content further, or indeed get in touch with us, please take a look at our website at jpmorgan.com slash market dash data dash intelligence. There, you can always send us a message via the contact us form. And with that, we'll close. Thank you. If you're enjoying this conversation, you can subscribe as well as our other podcasts to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Follow JP Morgan's Making Sense on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. The views expressed in this podcast may not necessarily reflect the views of J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. and its affiliates. Together, J.P. Morgan. They are not the product of J.P. Morgan's research department and do not constitute a recommendation, advice, or an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell any security or financial instrument. This podcast is intended for institutional and professional investors only and is not intended for retail investor use. It is provided for information purposes only. Reference products and services in this podcast may not be suitable for you and may not be available in all jurisdictions. J.P. Morgan may make markets and trade as principal in securities and other asset classes and financial products that may have been discussed. For additional disclaimers and regulatory disclosures, please visit www.jpmorgan.com forward slash disclosures forward slash sales and trading disclaimer.